Hi everybody, this is Adam Petrovsky and welcome to the Logicalis GovEd Solutions PowerPoint template tutorial on higher education for digital strategies. So um, just wanted to introduce myself and uh, I'm the practice leader for Logicalis GovEd and the purpose of this video today is so I can teach you how to present this higher education template PowerPoint deck for your customers. And I'm going to do a couple of unusual things. One is I'm going to go through the deck uh, kind of in two ways. One, uh, I will, of course, try to role play and be you giving this presentation to a, a customer from higher education. But then I'll also kind of get out of role a little bit and uh, give you some tips and ideas. And you, you'll be able to tell the difference uh, as to which one I'm doing. So let's start by the first slide here. The purpose of this slide is really to have a slide up on the wall while your customers are gathering for the discussion. So you could launch this and still have, be having some chit chat with customers, getting to know each other um, or making introductions. And uh, when you look at this deck, this is a standard PowerPoint template. So you can change the, the text here instead of calling it digital strategies, or you can put the name of the, the college or university you're working with here. Obviously you change your name and, and date. You could put the logo from the college or the university on here. Uh, you'll notice that we have a dark background, so you want to make sure you have a transparent logo so that it doesn't have a white blocky uh, look to it. Sort of like you have on the Lodge Callus logo, it's transparent, you can see through it. And uh, just for your knowledge, and in case anybody asks, on the left hand side there, you've got a photo of um, obviously a congested freeway system and this this is kind of representing uh, connected transportation which is on the government side that would be local and state government you have to deal with issues of connected transportation that's just used as an example for the government side of GovEb and then on the right side you actually have in this case the education side of, of GovEd and uh, these folks are college college students uh, learning some some information using a, a piece of technology in this case it's a laptop and so that's kind of how we, we have both sides of the Gov and the Ed sort of in the background. That's the standard uh, template. And if you, you, if you like, you can feel free to remove these pictures and put, your, uh, put other pictures in there if you like. Just make sure to, uh, to put them at a dark level, so correct the brightness so that it's down dark enough so that the, uh, the, other, the other items show through. All right, well, let's get started. And again, the uh, audience here would be um, anybody from higher ed, any stakeholder from a higher ed organization, preferably the higher level, the better. Uh, but it'll work with just about any anybody. So this next slide is kind of how you might start the conversation by talking about the GovEd um, vertical, so the GovEd practice itself. So at Logicalis, we have a, a dedicated vertical to government and education. We call it GovEd. And um, there's really two sides of it, but one of the things we tried to do is to come up with our point of view or our vision statement, if you will, for all of GovEd and then for the government side and the education side. So you'll see that we, our vision or our point of view for the entire practice is this statement, we focus on serving our communities or serving communities. Because when you really think about it, whether it's government or education, whether it's K through 12 higher ed or local government, state government, we're really serving a community, um, a, a local community in case of K through, K through 12 in the district, or we're serving a, a community um, in a city or a municipality or a state. And really that's what we do. We serve the community so that the community has a better outcome. On the education side, that outcome is better students uh, have higher academic performance that achieve better, uh, better engaged. And on the government side, it's uh, a better way to serve the constituents in the community uh, through, through services that are enabled by digitization. If you look at the two separate sides, we have two other um, points of view or, or focus statements, if you will. On the government side, it's to help them digitally transform. And really everything we do for local government, state government has to do with some type of digital transformation, uh, taking care of that, uh, that digital transformation or helping them pl uh, plan for that digital transformation. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And then on the, on the student side, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed, our vision statement here is empowering students to engage. And the reason we chose engagement as the, the overarching focus is because when you really start to think about how students excel and perform uh, and, and what kind of people they turn out to be after that they go through education, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed, 
Um, one of them is how they engage. So when they engage more, when they're more engaged in the class and out of class, when they're socially engaged, they actually turn out to be better people. So that engagement is really a high level uh, thought process and point of view. And this slide gives you the opportunity to talk as much or as little about these points of view or statements, but this is kind of how we think of, of gov government and education. And you'll notice there's not a lot of tech in here. It's about serving our community, right, and empowering students, helping governments become more digitally effective so that they can help their, their constituents better. So let's get right into the, the deck. And I love putting this slide up first because most people have seen this slide already and so this is a little bit of a fun i'm playing with uh, the audience here and that is you got the backdrop of a busy data center and on top of this we've had our graphic design team create these little synapses or little connecting points in the background um, but what you have in text here is the it priorities for higher ed and and pretty much every stakeholder you show this to is has going to seen this chart in some form or another uh, through an online blog or through an email or because they're, they're, uh, they read uh, journals or mags that are uh, from their industry. And they probably have seen it. And the source from this is Center for Digital Government, which is one of the biggest poll polling organizations for, for government and education. And so when you look at these top 10, I'm hoping they're gonna recognize them right away. And I even joke with them a little bit when I show them this slide. I mean, how many people have seen a slide like this before? You know, everybody's gonna say, of course they have. And on here are some really um, interesting uh, business outcome items, like number one, hiring and retaining the best staff. That's, that's absolutely true and critical. But you've also got a lot of tech stuff here, right? Developing IT funding models or uh, balancing agility, openness, and security, or providing user support, or the capacity for management change. And I really just want to drive into here that we know that they've seen it and we take this slide just as seriously as anybody else because th this is what happened when they polled people uh, like CIOs in higher education. These are the answers that they got. What we do differently at Logicalis though is we change the conversation to talk about transformation through digitization. So we know that there are IT trends from, from the previous slide and we, we want to address them as well. But at the end of the day, what we really want to do is we want to look at the most important things that that higher education organization has to have, the things that they really want to do, the, the, the organizations they really want to be, and help them to transform to that state by digitizing processes. And we'll talk a little bit about digitization, but when you think about it, whether it's K through 12, like you have some symbols on this slide, K through 12 or higher ed or local government or state government, everything really, the crux of everything we do and we talk about centers around this concept of digitizing something. And for just a minute, let's just create a simple example of this. Digitization of a process really simply is I look at an organization and I find a process in their organization that is old-fashioned. It's done in an analog way. Sometimes it involves paper. Um, sometimes it involves technology, but the technology data isn't actually used for anything and it kind of slips back into an analog way. So a classic example in higher education is I might use a laptop with Google Apps to create a paper, but the professor wants me to hand the paper in. So I got to go print the paper it suddenly now becomes an analog process again and all of the value of the digitization goes away. Um, so what we do is we look at that old process or that non-digitized process and we come up with a fully digitized way of doing it. Now at the end of that, that's not enough, right? It's not enough just to simply digitize a process. What we want to do is to give the power back to the college or university to take the data from that digitization and do something with it. And uh, if you all remember the story here, I like to tell little stories throughout the, the slide. You can put your own stories in here. But one of the stories I like to tell is, remember when voice over IP first came out and we were trying to get our customers to buy voice over IP and uh, the customer would say, do I still lift up the handset and hear the dial tone? And we go, yeah, it's, it's exactly the same. And they go, well, do I still you know, push the buttons and it makes a telephone call to the other side? And they go, yeah. And they go, is the, is the quality just as good on the other end of the line? And we go, absolutely, it's just as good. And they go, well, why should I buy it? What I have right now is just as good. Why would I want to digitize the telephone experience? And the answer is 
there is no reason. If, you're that, if that's all you're going to do is convert that process into a digital process, there is no difference. And why would you invest in something new or spend money to do something? The answer lied in the fact that once the telephone call was digitized, you could do all kinds of things with that. You could change it. You could record it. You could move it into a contact center. You could analyze the data. Um, you could transcribe it. I mean, you could do all kinds of things with this data that you could never do before. And that's the power of digitization. It's not simply creating the digital process. It's using the data once you have it in a digital format to be able to dramatically transform your organization. And that's what we focus on at Logicalis. It's not necessarily the trends, although the trends are important. It's really understanding what your organization does today in an analog or an old-fashioned way and coming up with a way to digitize it so that it can transform the things that you really want to be as an organization. So with that, let's talk about students because that's what we really are talking about. When we talk about a college or a university, we're talking about the student body. Those are our customers. Our, the, the students are our customers in every sense of the word. And uh, in order to, to do well with our customers, we have to understand our customers. That's true in, in anything as well as higher education. So this is a funny picture. It's taken, you know, in the 90s, um, early 2000s. This is at a big lecture hall. And of course, it, it's kind of funny that every student has a laptop of different kinds in their, in their, their, their laps. Uh, a couple of interesting things in here is, you know, when you start to count the number of devices in this room, um, it, it's an, a staggering number of devices and just the thought, there's no cables here, right? So just the thought of, of everybody being online with Wi-Fi in a lecture hall this size. I wonder how many of today's higher education lecture halls like this really have the bandwidth and capacity to be able to provide a digital curriculum um, in, a, in a room like this. The answer probably is, it, is it's not. Very few of them do. What these students are probably doing is taking notes. They're just digitally taking notes. Some of them might be surfing the web or doing something else. But for the most part, they're not demanding bandwidth and application use in this room. They're simply taking notes. This is the beginning of the digital era. And when we look at these students today, not only do they have all these devices, but there's things about them that make them different. And one of them is the fact that they're digital natives. Now, what's a digital native? A digital native is somebody that's been brought up um, as a millennial or, or, or even more than a millennial, a millennial plus, if you will. Um, and these are folks that really um, expect information at their fingertips, right? They think about something, they, know, they go and look up the answer to it. Um, they're, they're, dis they're very distracted because of the fact that they have so much information. They're overconnected as we talked as we've got on the slide here. And so because of the fact that they're digital, digital natives, they expect when they go into a learning environment to be digital. They expect it to be a digital experience. And uh, it's interesting to, see, to look at the studies of students who walk into a non-digital environment and they have trouble. They have difficulty uh, shifting their brain from even on the way over to the lecture hall, they've got uh, texts going, they're listening to digital music, uh, they've got their tablet cooking, they're processing something on their laptop, they, they come into the lecture hall and if it's not digital today, they just shut down. They just don't know, they don't know how to learn in a non-digital environment. So very different kind of student today. They're overconnected. We're going to talk about so many devices in, in so many rooms, but the average number of connected devices per student today is over five. And when you think about it's not just the laptop and the cell phone, it's all of the other IoT connected devices that they have. So that could be a tablet. Um, it, could, it could be an IoT sensor. It could be an Apple TV. It could be a Roku. It could be a Chromecast. Um, you know, there's just there's so many devices that students are bringing onto campus today that it's just uh, phenomenal the rate of connect connectiveness that these guys have, uh, if there's such a word. And then lastly, they want to learn their own way. So they, they, they know how they learn because they've been digitally engulfed in the way they learn. And you know what? They, they pick and choose how they learn best. So if they go to a website and it's not teaching them in the way that they prefer, they'll go to another site. And they'll keep doing this until they figure out the way that they learn best, and that's how they learn. So if colleges can't adapt to this concept of these digital natives coming in that rely on connectivity, think about this room today 
if I were actually wanting to put actual digital academic curriculum on all of these laptops at the same time. And I'm not talking about just launching a web browser, although that would be fine too. But what if I had an actual um, application that was, that was sitting on the college campus and the professor wanted everybody to log into the application right now via Wi-Fi? And you know, the questions I ask of higher education organizations is, number one, can your wireless LAN support um, 1,500 clients in the same room together in a secure way? Number two, is your network infrastructure that's across the campus uh, able to support the bandwidth requirements, the security requirements, and the speed requirements uh, from a switch packet perspective in order to be able to handle just this classroom? And then what will really blow your mind is if I have 40 or 50 of these classrooms going along and I really tested it, what would, it, what would that be like? I think the answer would be they wouldn't know uh, because they haven't tested that. They have not built it for that. Um, which is scary and thinking of uh, planning for the future infrastructure uh, still is going to be king right king is infrastructure that's wireless uh, as well as as well as uh, wired infrastructure and that includes the security <clears throat> because with all of these devices they have to figure it all out so we have a very different kind of student um, and, a, and a very different expectation of how they learn now we also have something else that's different and if you take a look at this quote here by Ted Mit Mitchell he's the undersecretary of the Department of Education he talks about, hey, it's not like uh, when I went to school and I was 18, I got dropped off by my parents, and uh, that was it. Uh, happy college, right? Go to college, have fun. Um, today, you've got these students who are in a different, um, they're, they're in a different kind of part of their lives. A lot of them are returning veterans. Um, some of them are single parents. Some of them um, are, are, are struggling to be able to pay for college themselves. And uh, there's lots of different, um, uh, it's, a, it's a different mix of students. And so it's really created something that we now call the new normal for higher education. And 74% um, of all undergraduate students, they have one of these non-traditional characteristics. And, I, and I'm not going to read all these. I wouldn't read them out to your, your customer either. But pick one or two that are interesting to you uh, to talk about. Like one of the things that's interesting is t almost 30%, 28% have at least one dependent. That, that wasn't like uh, colleges and universities 20 years ago. Um, having one dependent now means that they have to figure out ways in which it's most convenient for them to learn. And that has to mean some type of personalized learning. We're going to talk about personalized learning here in a minute. But it changes the face. So you've got this combination of a more connected, digital native type of a student who expects a digital curriculum in a digital environment. And then you have these new normal students who have a wide variety of characteristics, but it, it forces them to learn in a different way. And the solution to that learning is in a digital way. And once we, we create learning digitally, then we can personalize that learning for different learning styles. So bringing the conversation kind of back to the top, we talked about the student body, right, and how it's different. Let's talk about what a stakeholder at a college or university is thinking about. So this, this lady right here represents either the president of a college, a chancellor of a university, a CIO, a dean, a provost. Um, these are the guys and gals that are out there every day thinking about big picture topics. These folks are thinking about these really big, powerful business outcomes that are absolutely critical to them. This is the thing, these are the things that they're thinking about all the time. Now, not every one of these people is thinking about all of these different types of things. And I'm not suggesting that we go through every one of them because we just can't have time. But when you start to look at some of these, it's very possible that you'll meet a dean or a chancellor. And number one on their list is compliance. Maybe they're dealing with um, uh, academic compliance, accreditation, and that's top of mind today. And they're looking for ideas or solutions or technology that will help them to maintain accreditation or compliance. Or maybe they're concerned about enrollment. You know, enrollment is uh, absolutely critical because without the right enrollment at the right level of enrollment, then usually budget suffers and then they have to make difficult decisions that impact the, the campus, the university itself. So all of these are very important, right? Uh, there are some presidents that are very concerned about their athletic programs. That's the number one uh, thing that brings students to their campus. And so they put a lot of attention and thought process into these. The key here, bringing it all together is these really are, and there's more, right? This is just some. These really are the things that these stakeholders care about. These are the things that are important to them. And so our job at Logicalis is to ask and talk about these topics with these stakeholders 
and to ask them what they're thinking about in terms of these, these concepts. So online learning. Tell me about your online learning program. What does it really consist of? Walk me through the steps and stages, the experiences, the feedback. Walk me through your roadmap on how you get to the next level of online learning. You could have this same kind of question discussion with any of these topics, but I really want to drive home that this is really where it starts. Um, it's not going into a higher education place and saying, uh, I, want, I, I want to talk to you about your hard drive array, right? Or your disaster recovery solution, or how we can set up a cloud server for you. What we really need to do is talk about this, talk about these topics that are right here on the screen. And we're going to come back to this every single time we talk today because this is what's most important. This is what these folks really care about. And, uh, you know, it's a very important uh, axiom of, of selling, and that is people tend to do what's in the best interests of their business or themselves. So these, these folks are, are concerned about what's in the best interest of the college or university, and these are the kinds of things that they talk about. So with that, let's talk about some examples. We're going to go through four or five examples on how I can bring technology solutions that impact all of those those things on the screen back there that we just saw. So let's let's try the first one. Here's one that's really close to a lot of folks' heart, and that is that recruiting the right students, getting the right people recruited, the best diverse culture of students, the students that are aligned with vision of the college and university is of paramount importance. After all, if I don't recruit the right students, if those students aren't attracted to my college or university, I will not get the student body that I want. And ultimately, that will change the college, right? It changes the college determining on what is the makeup of the student body. And so some colleges uh, do very little in this area. Um, and they, they've got a team or a crew that make sure that the website's up to date and that they respond to inquiries and that they put out applications for people who request. And then there's other organizations on the complete opposite side that, that have a whole engine created to recruit the right students. And it's amazing that what you can do with the right technologies. So I put a, a few different technologies right here that directly impacts how colleges recruit the right students. So for example, from a data analytics perspective, if you're looking at, okay, here's the high school graduate pool in my community or through the, throughout the United States, how do I look at that data and I optimize the data so that I'm not just reaching out to 50,000 students, right? I'm reaching out to the right students with the right information, with the right data. So it's important to use data analytics tools to take your raw data and put it into data that you can understand that really is the, the students you want to drive to, to your school. And that leads us into another great technology, which is contact center. And I think in the olden days, or people sometimes still think of contact centers as, well, it's a bunch of agents sitting in cubes and they take phone calls, in, inbound or outbound phone calls, and students call in or they call out to students and they tell them how great the college is and they try to get them on the hook, right? In today's contact center, I call it 2.0, um, we're talking about the concept of being a much more integrated contact center. So these contact centers are not only voice centric, but they're also connected to the web. They're connected to texting. They're connected to email. They're connected through data analytics to be able to take the data that they get and to be able to compound on that more and more um, important data that will help attract that student better. So for example, on multimedia collaboration, which is our third block here, um, how cool is this? I get a student that's on my website, which I got to have a pretty good website and we can help, again, we can help colleges to come up with an entire digital strategy for recruiting. If they're on my website for seven to 10 minutes, that means they're probably pretty interested and I could reach out through chat and say, I noticed you've been on the, the website for seven to 10 minutes. We've got an awesome uh, group of folks that would love to help you know more about the university. Are you interested? And so we could have a little chat conversation and, and if it's right, that chat conversation can immediately be turned on by the contact center agent to be a video chat conversation. So now I can leverage multimedia collaboration right inside that session to say, hey, do you have five or 10 minutes? I just want to tell you a couple of things that are awesome about the university, or I want to get you in touch with somebody who does. Can I schedule a meeting via WebEx? And again, with a click of the switch, I can change it from just a video chat into a full-blown WebEx where there could be a little presentation. Um, and so this, this is a whole awareness campaign that goes on, which can dramatically change recruiting if recruiting is important to the college or university. So here's a perfect example how digitization drives an outcome. That outcome is recruiting. And you've seen some technology now that can do that. So great, great first example, right? Now, if I take a look at another area in 
colleges and universities, this was on the most important care abouts, and that is a lot of folks are looking at learning. So online learning, personalized learning, how do we teach our students differently, and how do we test and assess our students differently? And a lot of uh, colleges and universities think that we can just kind of sit back and let this go as it takes its own, its own personality. Unfortunately, the actual truth is the first statement on the slide here, and that is there is so much digitization happening in learning, teaching, and assessing that it's pulling us in tighter. So those colleges and universities that don't see this are going to get left behind for those colleges and universities that are proactive about figuring out how do we digitally change learning, teaching, and assessments. So let's take a look at some examples. Here's a spotlight on personalized learning. And all higher education organizations are doing something about this. And the concept here is no two students learn the same way. And they, they can be taught in different ways and both have great outcomes. And so from a technology perspective, You've got the center here, which is personalized learning. But when you start doing things like taking a digital courseware from a curriculum provider, which kind of goes to curriculum design over here, and integrating it into your network and your learning management system, the further and tighter those are integrated, the more data you'll have to be able to go and look at personalized learning to say, hmm, I notice that this student, when they take this type of courseware, performs in this fashion, and this student who did the exact same thing performs differently. What's the difference? And you'll start to have the data to be able to analyze, what should I change? What could I change? What if we tried something else from a personalized learning perspective? And there are whole companies that LogiCalis partners with that focus on things like personalized learning and digital curriculum. We also know that things like advising services, so the student counselors and advisors that are teaching the kids, you know, this is how you should take your classes, this is, this, is, this is what you should do if you're having trouble, those people need to be hooked in to this personalized learning loop because then they could provide feedback saying, hey, I noticed this outcome based upon what you were doing here because I looked into the LMS system, I'm part of this digital system, and I can give you personalized advice. And it's the same thing all the way down to the instructor, right? The instructor, the professor has to be part of this personalized learning engagement. Otherwise, we get let, we leave those, per, those people behind. And we want to keep those professors and enable them to give them the personalized learning um, background to be able to understand how it works. So instructors need to be part of this journey, this voyage. And we can help colleges with this voyage of how do you move from a, a traditional learning environment to a personalized learning environment. Ultimately, you'll have better student outcomes. So there's a, there's a great example, right? Here's another one. And this is how do we test kids, right? How do we test students and assess them? And one of the things that, that it is a movement in higher education is these technology-enabled assessments. So it's more than just opening my laptop and taking the assessment via a digital mechanism. It's actually having that test integrated into a full digital environment so that there, it can be adapted um, uh, based on the content or delivery. Or a professor or faculty member can get real-time insights. If an entire class is taking a test and I've got this whole thing digitally enabled, I can look at this and go, wow, the whole class is missing this whole section on this one particular topic. How do I adapt my content or delivery to be able to change that instantly? So this is a huge area um, of changing the way we, we test. And this is all part of the learning roadmap, right? This is on how, how kids are assessed. I might have a, a, a student that may be a fantastic test taker and perform very well academically, and another student who has a great understanding of the material but doesn't test very well. How can I assess that student differently? And it's through these types of digital learning models uh, that you'll be able to do that. So here's another great way Logicalis can partner to provide a digital solution to a real student outcome, which is one of those really big care abouts that the stakeholders have. Now let's shift on to another piece about learning, because we're talking about learning. And that is, if I ask anybody in higher education today about their online learning program, almost everybody has one, right? I've talked to them, almost everyone has one. But when you start asking them questions like, what is it like? And they kind of scratch their head and go, what do you mean, what is it like? And I say, well, when they go on to, to the website to, to do their online learning, maybe it's from their LMS system or whatever, um, what's their engagement? And you'll be shocked to, to see the wide variety of engagement on, on people calling it online learning, which is kind of a wastebasket term today. Because some online learning is as simple as there's a PDF. 
and they have to review the PDF, take a quiz on it, and that counts as, as online learning. Um, you see some online learning where there's a PowerPoint deck that runs with the recording, very similar to the one you're watching right here, and all they have to do is watch the video. And at the end of the video, they take the quiz, and that's their online learning. You'll also find on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, very interactive, immersive collaboration with students engaged all in real time. Students today expect a better online learning experience. And the way you get that is through continuing to digitize the environment. And I'll show you a couple of ideas here that, um, that are great solutions and examples of these concepts. So one of them is the concept of lecture capture. Now lecture capture has been around for a long time. The idea of lecture capture was that we're going to put up a whole bunch of um, video cameras and microphones and uh, have whiteboards and electronic PowerPoint presentations and we're going to actually have a real interactive classroom all over the web in real time. Now the challenges of doing that have proven to be very significant, especially to the lecturer who has to manage and manipulate the technology or you have to hire a resource to manage and manipulate the technology. So you're more seeing recorded versions of that lecture capture. And I'm kind of calling this lecture capture 2.0 because at the end, I want to create a more lifelike expression of the lecture. Um, unfortunately, I can't do everything at one time. It's not going to be completely interactive. But I can do things like this, the item on the screen here on the right, where I have a live stream of the professor uh, or the faculty member teaching. So they get to actually see facial expression, which is really important for learning. I get a live time view of the PowerPoint presentation or the whiteboard. Uh, there's devices that capture the whiteboard. And then on the right here, I've got real time chatter. So real time chat going on with students that are watching this in real time so that they can interact with each other, right? So they can see it, they can understand it. And uh, you can kind of go back and forth. So the key is where does the school want to be with online learning? And our job is to help them understand that, that roadmap, right? The, the voyage to online learning and where do you want to be? Where does the college want to be? And again, this is part of tracking the right students that come on, on and to see the, the students that are there. They come for a visit and they, they ask other students, how is the online learning like? Or they take a free class on online learning and are, do they walk away going, this is incredible, this is like being in the classroom? Or do they walk away sort of saying, well, it's not anywhere near being in class. It's better to be in class. So until we close that gap, um, we'll always have that, that true classroom environment being better. Our job is to figure out how do we move it, right? How do we move that needle towards a more realistic environment? And this is another shift to, uh, to IoT. So the Internet of Things is everywhere, especially on college campuses. There's so many devices. We talked about the number of devices that are out there. One of the things that um, tomorrow's IoT may be is video cameras. And this consensus is being drawn throughout the technology industry, throughout all industries. Um, and that is video may be tomorrow's sensor because a video screen can capture so many things uh, so I won't need that sensor anymore. I won't need that tr that trip wire anymore to be able to know what's going on. So instead of having a sensor or a temperature reader, um, as long as something could be seen in that video screen, I can capture it digitally and say, hey, when you see something happen in that part of the video screen, trigger an event. And so you're going to see a lot of these things. And uh, on college campuses, the big use for video is surveillance, is is campus safety. And I'll tell you, this is one topic that almost everybody on a stakeholder level wants to talk about because everybody is concerned about co uh, college campus safety, university safety, and video surveillances are exploding. Video surveillance cameras are exploding on campus today. So whereas uh, five years ago, you might have had a, a college campus with 100 cameras, today, uh, analyzing that same campus, you probably need 10 times the number of that video camera. And that's because we're not covering enough area, right? We're not being able to put enough video surveillance in to keep a safe environment. Not only uh, video surveillance, but access control is, is also just as important. I'm gonna show you a spotlight on this in just a second. And then probably a, a huge one here is emergency notification. This is the one we don't talk about enough. Um, and, and that's the concept of is when, when there is an incident that happens on campus, uh, there's a safety concern that happens. How does everybody else know about it? Um, and unfortunately, I've seen too many examples where uh, an incident occurs, it's something significant and horrible, and uh, it takes hours uh, for everybody to learn of the incident. 
And it's important to, to learn of the incident, not just so that we can continue to have safety and avoid the situation, but um, communication is critical in order for, for me to maintain um, uh, an understanding in the campus that everybody is, is aware. Awareness is key, especially for parents. Um, and so uh, it's incredible how how easy these systems are to set up, but we can do notification to anything, right? We can notify to cell phones, to um, digital displays, to IP phones at, uh, in the classrooms, um, you know, pretty much anywhere we can notify and we can do it through a, a consultative approach so that we understand the university's requirements and we can set up a series of cascading uh, notifications. Again, this is part of a journey, right? What's the journey towards having a safe campus? It's a multi-pronged approach that includes video surveillance, how those video surveillances are done and then there's all kinds of things and questions that you have to ask yourself about it so uh, this slide talks about the questions that are important to discuss about compliance and what do you do with the data once the video camera has recorded that information and what's the uh, you know what is the integration between video surveillance access control and emergency notification if an incident occurs here what are the cameras supposed to then do and what is the access control supposed to lock or unlock so it's amazing some of the stuff we're seeing. There are technologies that we were, uh, were engaged with with colleges and universities surrounding um, the all-powerful cell phone. So today's smartphones are intelligent for a very important reason, and that is they have biometrics. Most have biometrics. And if you can have a biometric on a phone, well, then you actually have the digital fingerprint of that student. Um, and in theory, you could know where that student is, and you could provide access based on that cell phone. So. Instead of using uh, proximity cards to gain access to a door uh, um, at a dorm or a library or a cafeteria, in theory, you could use a cell phone. And uh, colleges have done some amazing things with applications on the cell phone for notification to uh, GPS location. Um, to being able to have all their applications in one place. It's just, um, this is another uh, journey conversation. So again, just having the conversations about what are you doing um, from a, a single pane of glass perspective to allow students to interact with their cell phone and, and what could the cell phone represent for you and you the campus and the students. So lots of, lots of incredible stuff. I think this is the next to last one here and, and that is we, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about research at, at colleges and universities, some of them have extremely important research divisions that are doing everything from um, medical clinical stuff to uh, astrometrics and physics and um, uh, just amazing stuff. And um, part of the, the deal with research is, you know, research is based upon time. Everything is based on time. They get grants and monies based on time and, per and performance. And um, if one research organization can get that data crunched just a little bit faster, and be able to have some predictable results. That makes all the difference in the world. So here comes IBM Watson. Uh, I've got the photo here of the Jeopardy game uh, a, a little while ago when, uh, when Watson came on 127 episodes or some number like that. And there you see him in the middle with a million dollars. Um, this, this is the today's reality. Um, and that is uh, Watson represents artificial intelligence and cognitive um, you know, computing, which is really happening today. And you see uh, IBM Watson deployed in some, some medical institutions and hospitals, and you, you see him involved in research. And that's because uh, these researchers can use hyperconverged technology and predictive analysis to be able to, to increase research timeframes and to be able to come up with predictions that researchers were doing themselves. So the idea of being able to do that is phenomenal and we're seeing more and more colleges with research institutions implement these types of technologies and so here's uh here's just another spotlight here so at, at the uh, top here you've got things like they already have now they've got some compute and storage you add that cloud-based data analysis so that you can uh, crunch the numbers better and faster and then you add some global data sets which uh, Watson's uh, global cloud has all of these additional data sets and you can think from a research perspective that you know they have tons of data that's out there in the cloud from around the globe. You add that with hyperconvergent solutions so you've got super fast computing uh, supercomputers and you've got all of the uh, the hardware and gear that's associated with that and then you add that AI cognitive engine in there and what you come up with is is a completely revolutionized way to do uh, research at a university level so absolutely something again it's a conversation a voyage discussion to talk about so we work with a lot of different colleges and universities this slide here is uh, a sample 
um, and you're more than welcome to change these out and put your colleges that you've worked with on here. Um, these are some of the, the higher, you know, more recognizable universities and colleges, but there's plenty that we do that are smaller that might be perfect for your, your customer that you're talking to. And again, this, uh, this can just be popped in or out. So uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't end by talking about Logicalis just with a few slides. I'm one of those persons that tends to, to wait until the end to talk about Logicalis. There are some people that like to talk about that first. But I, I think the perspective here is let's, let's talk about them and let's talk about things we can do to help them. And then we'll put some context about our, our organization. So I've got the Logicalis GovEd um, uh, puzzle piece here and it basically it makes up the whole and the concept here is even though we're talking about higher education there are things that our practice does in K through 12 and local government state government that impact higher education especially shared things like uh, contract resources and federal budgeting or state budgeting uh, some of that comes in handy so it's really nice to have a practice that has all of this together and when you think about Logicalis, you know, you could put any data that you want on your About Logicalis slide. This is what I put on mine. I just want a one pager here. We're a global technology services and solutions company, and we focus differently. We focus on solutions. Our U.S. operations is a, is a, a nice, decent size, but not a mega giant um, caught up in bureaucracy. We're, a, we're a, an agile, flexible organization of about 550 million. And when people think of us, they typically think of data center and cloud. They think of service management, service desk and managed services. Service-based approach um, is really what we're known for. And vertical practices in both healthcare and gov ed, which together make up about 30% of our total, our total revenue stream, which is very significant and continues to grow. How do we measure success, uh, how do we, sorry, how do we measure success with higher ed? Well, we do it three ways. We talked about them today, but here's the summary. And number one is <clears throat> we've got to get the students to engage. So anything we can do by implementing technologies and the outcome of that is the students engage better, that's success, right? Number two is safety and security. So it's not just the safety and security of the students and faculty. That is a successful measure, but it's also about the safety and security of your data. So um, the safety and security of your people, identity management, uh, the ability to manage your data. Um, and to keep it secure. And that's success, right? And number three is uh, the concept of the digital education experience. Anything we can do to help digitize the experience and because of that digitization, um, you get increases in efficiency or productivity or new ways to teach students, that's a, that's a home run too. That's success as well. So those are really our key, key factors. Um, another component here is that in GovEd, we realize that we have to talk to four different groups of people when we engage with you. So even though we love to talk to technical people to, to help understand the requirements of the technology, we also like to talk to political uh, factions. So a lot of colleges have college board members and their voice is very powerful and you'll have a great stakeholder if you can talk to them. From a line of business, these are those folks that we talked about before, right? Presidents of the college, provosts, chancellors, deans. Um, those people are concerned about those business outcomes that we showed in the beginning of the, the deck. And then lastly, but very importantly, is procurement. If we uh, have a, a public organization, public college or university, and they go through a procurement process, we better know that, that process and policy. And then we better be able to have the contract vehicles to be able to help move it along. And this is a little bit of a... Uh, purposely too small slide. We have over 50 contracts throughout the United States. We're adding more every day. Um, and we, that's one of the things we do is we try to keep, keep uh, abreast of the, the contracts that will be able to help the university to be able to procure. And that sometimes is everything, right? It, uh, you might want it, but you might not be able to procure it without the right vehicle. So we work hard on that. And the four things that really make us different um, I'm hopefully you got the message by now, but number one is we really focus on that student outcome, right? That's the customer. That's where we focus. Number two is because we have a dedicated practice, we know GovEd. We know the experiences other higher education organizations have had, and we share them with you when we talk with you. Number three is our approach and engagement process is different. Hopefully you've seen it throughout this deck, which is we tend not to talk about the technology. We tend to talk about the business outcomes and how we engage with you and that digital roadmap, that voyage that you have to make for any of those, those areas we talked about. And lastly is the procurement position. Hopefully we have a unique combination of all four of these, which makes a, a Logicalis the right choice for you. 
And this is my closing slide. You, you're happy to, again, edit this slide, put whatever photos or, or comments you have on here, your name, where they can reach you for more information. This could be a perfect uh, slide for questions if they wanted to talk about questions. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. So thank you guys so much for listening. I know it was a, a long one, but hopefully you picked up some pointers here and you were able to deliver it in your own style. And uh, that's the objective here. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, happy selling. Take care.